hands-on with food. Hopefully some of you have known about the Dining by Decades events that he's been doing tomorrow night at Pittsfield at 6.30. It's totally tubular, Dining by Decades in the 80s. So if that's of interest to you, you might want to check that out tomorrow night. Um, I will give you fair warning. We have crusts for 20 people. So we are going to have to come up with some way that we figure that out, that we all share and work together. So um, give a warm welcome. Hopefully, who's been to Lake House Bakery in Chelsea so before? So that's of interest to you, you might <laughs> um, When Keegan started with this, he was at the co-op, and I've gotten to be here while he's founded his li um, whole business. So please give a warm welcome to Keegan Rogers. Yeah, we were talking tonight that um, I've been doing classes at the library for 10 years now. Yeah, can't believe it. So, hi everyone. I am so excited. First of all, that y'all are here. And second, you didn't realize that you were signing up to be my minions, did you? It, there's no charge. It's free. Um, but you will, by the end of this, be a pie convert. Who doesn't like pie? And I better not see any yeah, hands. We were talking tonight that, uh, right? I love pie. I absolutely love everything about pie. If I could only have one food for the rest of my life, it would be pie. Love pie. I even have a sticker on my water bottle that says, love me some pie. I love pie. So we're going to talk about pies tonight. We're going to go through um, a little of this presentation that I've got. Um, and if you've got questions as I'm doing this, please stop me and ask. I want you to, to get as much information as you can. I see some people have some notebooks. That's great. I love that. I sucked at taking notes in college. I was terrible at it. But hopefully you're much better at it and you'll, you'll get some really great information. So here we go. Pies. This is what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the difference between a pie and a tart. We're going to talk about the crust, the filling, some toppings. What the heck is a galet? Then we'll talk about my pie crust and then 20 lucky people, I'm not sure again how we'll figure this out, but we've, I brought enough for 20 people to make pie dough. We're going to make some pie dough, and then you'll go home with it. And I'm, I'm going to warn you right now, and I apologize from the bottom of my heart, y'all have been lied to. And I'll, I'll tell you when and what that's all about when we get there. So the difference between a pie and a tart is the pan. That's it. That's all there is to it. So pie pans go like this. Tart pans go like this. That's it. They could be fluted. They could be straight. It doesn't matter. But that's truly really the only difference is the angle of the tin. So they're pretty much interchangeable. If you can make a lemon meringue pie, you could make a lemon meringue tart. You want to make a caramelized onion goat cheese tart, you can make a caramelized onion goat cheese pie. Why not? You're also going to hear me say this phrase many times tonight, whatever you want, because pie is that easy. Who's tried to make pie crust at home? Successfully? Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll fix that tonight. But th it really is just the, that's the only difference between pies and tarts. Now, there, er, there are some traditionally like only tart doughs, and there are some traditionally only pie doughs, but they really are interchangeable. Typically, a tart dough is a bit sweeter, and typically, a pie dough is a bit more either neutral or savory. Like, that's it. Not much of a difference, is it? But you end up getting charged a lot more for a tart, don't you? It's balderdash. All right, the pan. The crust. I touched on this just a second ago. Again, there's a little bit more sweet for a pâté sucré, typically for a tart. It's more of a shortbread crust sometimes for a tart. But a pie shell will work just as well in a tart pan. Um, and that's really the main difference. Um, they're, they're both flour. They're both butter. Sometimes you'll have eggs in a tart shell. Sometimes you won't. It's whatever you want. Because it's pie. I love pie. Um, you can use graham cracker crusts for no-bake pies or pies that don't require being baked to finish. You know, chocolate mousse. Oh, right. 
Right? Have y'all eaten, by the way? Because <laughs> apologies now, because you're going to be hungry in a little bit, because I'm going to keep talking about pie and how awesome pie is. Um, nut or coconut? That's a really nice option for people that have a gluten insensitivity or, um, or have celiac. So instead of, because graham crackers still have flour, some, you can find gluten-free graham cracker crumbs. But what you could do is, let's say you're making a key lime pie. Right? Because it's key lime pie. And you're taking it to, the, to your friend's house, and someone there has a gluten intolerance. All right? So make it with coconut. Just coconut. Put it in your pie tin. Toast it in your pie tin. Add your key lime filling. Boom, key lime pie. How easy was that? Because it's easy as pie. <laughs> or if it's not, if there's no nut allergies um, in the, whoever's going to eat it, then make it almonds or make it walnuts. Make it coconut with almonds. Why not? It's whatever you want. Because it's pie. I, I just, I love pie. All right, so now, and I didn't think to bring my tins, and I apologize, it's been a long day. Um, I'm going to talk to you about blind baking and par baking. Who knows what those two terms are, par baking or blind baking? All right, a couple people. So par baking is what it sounds like. It's partially, par, partially baking the pie shell. Blind baking is fully baking the pie shell with nothing in it. Right? Well, why would you do that? Why would you, like, you're not going to eat just a pie crust, although I have, I'll be honest. So parsley baking partially. is really good if you're making quiche, um, specifically quiche, simply because the egg proteins in the, sh the filling are stronger than the gluten proteins in the shell, and sometimes if you don't par-bake your shell, you'll get this little thin gap between the egg custard and the pie shell. Anybody ever make a quiche and have that? That's why that happened. If you partially bake the shell, let it cool or not, and then put your fillings in it. Let's say it's broccoli cheddar. Let's say, um, what if it's, um, oh, spinach feta with red onion. Have your, put that in your, in your pie shell, put your egg custard in it, and then bake it that little gap won't happen. So that's partially baking it. Now, blind baking is, again, it's fully baking the shell with nothing in it. And you would do that for things like lemon chiffon, chocolate mousse, strawberry chiffon, anything that doesn't require further baking to finish. Um, like, there's all kinds of those. Chocolate pudding, right? You don't need, although if you're going to make chocolate pudding, just go ahead and make chocolate mousse. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just saying. Um, banana, coconut cream, right? Those don't require baking to finish them off. So you would fully bake your shell so that you don't eat raw dough while you're having your slice of coconut cream pie. Love coconut cream pie. Although my favorite, lemon meringue. Can't go wrong with a good lemon meringue pie. Love that stuff. Um, all right, the one thing I do want to tell you, though, and I, I, I wish I'd brought this, but we're going to use my hands. We're going to pretend my hands are pie tins. When you're partially baking or blind baking your shell, you want to, do, you want to treat it a little differently. You'll roll out your pie dough, and you'll put it in your pie tin, and you'll put it in your pie tin, and this is my pie tin. Then you're going to take another pie tin, and you're going to sandwich it on top of the dough like this. And then you're going to flip it upside down. And you're going to put another sheet pan on top of it, and you're going to bake it for about 25, 30 minutes like that. Some people will tell you, and some cookbooks will have in there, for you to use pie weights or beans, dried beans. I ain't got time for that. And then you got to like pick them all out and then it's just a mess. And, but if you take your pie tin and you sandwich it and then you bake it upside down, you've got gravity working for you to keep it in the shell. 
Gravity typically is our friend, unless you're falling forward on you, right? Then it's not. But if you bake them upside down, then it'll stay in that shape and you won't have to worry about it. So Aaron's... And then we'll collect the names and then we'll draw the names for making the pie dough. When you cook them upside down like that, mm -hmm. do you have to do it on another cooking sheet? Or you just yep, so on a sheet pan. Two, two cooking sheets. Yep. One on the bottom, one on the top. So That's it. That's it. And bake at the same temperature? Yeah. Um, typically 375 sure. for about 25 to 30 minutes, depending on your oven. Another sheet pan or something that's not too terribly heavy, but you do need some weight so it doesn't like flop off. So you need just a little something on there. It does perfectly fine. I, I, we do 80 quiche a week at the bakery, and that's exactly how we do our, our par baker quiche. And the question was about, you know, what, um, what temperature in your oven. 375 for about 25, 30 minutes. Um, if you're fully baking it, 30 minutes. If you're partially baking it, go 20-ish minutes. Now, the way to tell if it's either of those done, when being very careful, take it from the oven. And if you can use your thumb and just kind of flick that top pie tin off, it's at least partially baked. If it won't lose, easily kind of flip off, put it back in for another few minutes. And you'll tell the difference between partially baked and fully baked by the color of it when you flip it off. Now, I do have to say the caveat to this is it won't work with anything but the tins. So a Pyrex dish or Aunt, you know, Great Aunt Fanny's ceramic, it won't work. Glass won't work. It only works with the dollar store pie tins. Yep, the aluminum cheap tins. Yep, well, I mean, we reduce, reuse, re but yeah, I mean, just the, the tins. Because again, the, 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 the weight of the tin isn't enough, it won't smush it completely. But, you know, the ceramic or the Pyrex is too heavy, it won't work. But, you know, and you're wondering, well, well what if I want to use Great Aunt Fanny's, you know, ceramic antique pie? Put it in after it's baked. Nobody's really going to know. And then you can still use it, and it'll be a lot easier to clean up. Oh, what did I do? Oh, here it is. Any questions on crusts? Yeah. You can add water. And just pat it in. Mm -hmm. Just pat it in. And it doesn't matter if it's the shredded coconut or the angel flake. Either one works. And do you bake it then? Yep. So you'll you'll put you'll put it you'll press it into your tin, and then toast it for like ten minutes. Pull it out, let it cool, and then being very careful so that it, you don't like pour too heavy or too hard. Gently pour the key lime filling or the lemon curd filling or whatever, the banana pudding, right? Like, how good would a banana coconut cream pie be? Like, let's just combine them, shall we? Because that sounds amazing, right? Just be careful when you're pouring that in so you don't break up the coconut and it will, it will go underneath. So we don't want that. So we're just being very careful to either spoon it in or gently pour so that you don't break up that coconut. Did that answer your question? Awesome. Any other questions on crusts? Par baking, blind baking. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what about baking strudel? Strudel? Strudel is a whole nother animal. Um, that's a, it's a laminated dough um, that gets stretched out as big as the table. Like, it's a whole separate process. Um, and are you talking like a strudel topping or like traditional strudel? Yeah, that's a whole other animal and not anywhere related to pie. Still yummy. I love me some strudel, but not pie. Yeah. Um, it's actually very complicated to make because the dough does get stretched so thin. I mean, it's, it's paper-thin dough, 
that gets folded and folded with a filling and then it's beautiful and braided on top and yummy, but yeah, not, not pie. It's not something I would recommend for a novice baker. This is yeah, something anyone can do. And I mean that. All right, the filling, whatever you want. Right? I mean, again, not kidding, but whatever you want. I could turn just about anything into a pie. Keeping in mind that pizza counts because it's pizza pie. Right? Typically, though, when you think of pie, you think of a fruit filling. Or you think of custard, mousse, right? A coconut cream, banana cream. But quiche, right? That's a custard. You don't really think about it, but it is. Um, that could also be a chicken pot pie. We makes it like we're we we went through in two weeks and it just we went through fifty seven chicken pot pies at the bakery in two weeks. There's I just love chicken pot pies. It's still pie. Um, not all pies are baked to finish. Typically, though, tarts aren't. Typically, a tart is finished by itself. But that could not be the case, because if you're making a pear almond tart and you're using frangipan with red wine poached pears, you have to bake that. It's still a tart. So again, they're kind of interchangeable, and you wouldn't necessarily, sometimes you'll do like a tart shell with a custard filling and then some fresh fruit on top with a, an apricot or a, a raspberry glaze on top of that, right? Beautiful. Are tarts just not as full as a pie? Tarts are typically that thick. And pie is like Pies are typically, you know, a, a, a deeper pie is going to be about three inch, two and a half to three inch. Whereas the tart is typically an inch and a half to two. To me, that's the kind of the difference. Yeah. Height. Height. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, so let's talk about fruit fillings for a second. Who remembers Big Boy Strawberry Pie? <laughs> right? And the red goo. <laughs> and it's really what it, what, right? Who's cooked strawberries before? Right? They just disintegrate. Right? You'd make in a strawberry rhubarb pie, yum. The strawberries just disintegrate completely. So how did Big Boy do that? Because when you go to Big Boy to get a slice of pie, first of all, the pie had to be this tall. And it was this red goo with these whole strawberries in it. Well, they used what they call is the cooked juice method to make the pie filling. So. There's a Kroger next door, and I'm sure in their refrigerated section they have a jar of cherry juice, tart cherry juice. That's because cherry pie. Can't go wrong with that. Take that cherry juice, add some sugar and some cornstarch, and cook it down, and it will create the red goo. And then you just take cherries and add it to make your cherry pie filling. And that's what Big Boy did. They took strawberry juice created the goo, and then put whole strawberries in it so that you bit into a whole strawberry. That's the cooked juice method. Most pie fillings are the cooked fruit method. So you take the whole fruit and nothing but the fruit, and you cook that with some sugar and some cornstarch and some seasonings if you like. So if you've got apples, so like for Thanksgiving, we did apple pie, but we also added some cinnamon, some nutmeg, and some ginger. When we make blueberry pie, sometimes we'll add some cinnamon. When we make cherry pie, we'll add some almond. So whatever flavor you want to add to it. And you cook that all together to create the fruit and the goo at the same time. And typically, again, next door at Kroger, they've got the jars of fruit pie filling. That's what those are. Now, the great thing about the cooked fruit filling is it doesn't have to be pie filling. It could go with some granola, it could go on some yogurt, it could go with some ice cream, it could, if it's cherry, go on chocolate cake, it could go like with some ice cream, like whatever you want, because it's pie filling. 
That stuff is amazing. And very simple to make. So those are typically the two types of fruit fillings that you'll see for pies. Um, custard, again, it could be custard, but typically that's going to be quiche. Because whether you realize it or not, that's what a quiche is. It's an egg custard that has stuff in it. Stuff could be whatever you want. Um, mousse, like chocolate mousse. I don't need to say anything else, just chocolate mousse. Anyway, any other questions on fillings? All right, toppings, whatever you want. It doesn't have to be topped. Pumpkin pies are not topped. That's a custard pie, by the way, if you think about it. But you're using a vegetable, which how cool is that, right? Getting you two servings of vegetables in every slice. I don't know that to be true, but I'm going with it. Um, pies can be top, topped. Tarts typically aren't. Now, a glaze is kind of topping it, but they don't consider that a topping because it just seals the fruit in so that it doesn't go bad. It, take, you know, it sits a little bit longer. So typically, tarts are not topped. But that's not always the case because you could totally do um, some kind of a, let's go with a raspberry chocolate tart with a lattice top. Why not? Because it's pie. Um, double crust, pretty much what it sounds like, right? There's a crust in the shell and there's a whole crust on the top. That could be a whole crust or it could be a lattice top. Um, and I'll walk you through an easy way to make a lattice top in a second. Um, meringue. Oh, I love meringue. When I was a kid, I pronounced it meringue because that's how it looks. And sometimes I'll still say that just for fun because it is kind of fun to say meringue, right? And then whipped cream, right? Big boy, strawberry pie, <laughs> whipped cream. Pumpkin pie, although I don't. I just pumpkin pie. I love that stuff. Don't need any whipped cream on it whatsoever. Um, Crumb. So that, this bottom picture is a crumb pie. Now typically that's going to be butter, flour, and sugar mixed together to just the right point and then sprinkled over the top. You could add oats and cinnamon and have an oaty um, crumble topped pie. If you're doing a double crust pie, let's say apple because we just had Thanksgiving, Who's ever made an apple pie with fresh apples and a double crust? Did you notice that there was a, when you, when you covered the pie, the apples, it was right there, it, right on top of the apples, but when you pulled it out, the apples were down here. What the heck? You weren't cheated. So this space is called the snackmosphere in between. And the reason that happened was because as you cooked the apple pie, the, apple, the moisture in the apples cooked out, mixed in with the flour to create some goo. If you use the cooked fruit method of making pie filling that I just talked about and use that in your apple pie, that won't happen. The crust will stay right on top because you've already cooked it. The moisture has already been cooked out, so it will stay right where it's supposed to. And you won't have that snackmosphere, which I always feel robbed when I get that, right? I don't care. I love it. Oh, I want all the pie filling. I do. I want all the pie filling. Unless, like, you put some, some whipped cream in there, maybe, that would and fill it. Or, but I just, I like all the pie filling. You still will. If, if you use fresh apples. So if you go to an orchard and you get a pack of apples and you peel them, core them, slice them, sugar them, coat them, and then put them in the raw pie dough and put the whole thing in raw, it will still happen. It won't be as noticeable because the lattice can flex some, but it will still happen. All right, so lattice crust. It should just float down on it. 
especially if you're doing something like decorative leaves or circles or you know whatever design you want to put on it, then if it's just on the, the fruit, it should stay on it as long as it's not fully tented over. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but um, I would, I mean, it's totally up to you. You could do whatever you want. You could have like a ring of leaves around it and then some sporadically topped on top. You could put like whatever you want. Or you could just have a whole cluster. You probably could have a whole cluster of gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so lattice crust. You've got your pie dough rolled out. You're going to take... Um, a, a pizza cutter or a um, butter knife or something to cut it into whatever size strips you want. They could be wide, they could be narrow, whatever you want, because it's pie. Um, so let you, you cut them out and you've got um, another piece of parchment or a sheet pan next to you. And you're going to take, I don't know, let's say six strips of the pie dough and you're going to put them one, two, three, four, five, six. But you're actually going to number them two, four, six, eight, ten. Then you're going to take, nope, I take that back, one through ten. Then you can take two, four, six, eight and fold it back and lay a piece of pie dough across it. Then you're going to take those and lay them down, and then you take one, three, five, seven, and lift those up and lay a piece across it. And then keep doing that process, so evens and then odds, to get your lattice. Now notice you're doing this on a piece of parchment on a sheet pan, not on the pie. And you're going to take that and you're going to put it in the refrigerator for about 10 minutes so that it firms up a bit, so that you can easily pick it up and put it on the pie. Because trying to do the lattice on the pie is a pain in the neck. Like, it's just horrible. But if you do it, that way you can kind of finagle it and you can like be really precise on it. You can, have, you can get a measuring tape out if you want and like quarter inch lattice, ha like whatever you want. You can perfect it on the pie on the pie on the sheet pan and then let it set for a, f a few minutes and then put it on your pie. That way it still looks just as beautiful and you can crimp from that. That way you're not trying to do it all at the same time cuz that's a nightmare. You could even egg wash and sugar the lattice before you put it on the pie. It's all about working smarter not harder. Does that make sense to everyone? The two, four, six, eight, one, three, five, seven. Does that work? Yep. Awesome. All right. Um, ta, 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 double cross. Uh, any other questions on toppings? Did I hit all the highlights? Any other questions on toppings? All right. A galet. So a galet is just a really rustic, simple, open face pie without a tart, without a, a shell, without a tin, without a pan, it's just by itself. You can make them sweet or savory, you can do whatever you want, because it's pie. Um, typically this is a really good example of what they look like. So you have your pie dough rolled out, you put your filling in the middle, imagine ricotta with caramelized onion and um, shallot. Why not? Or apple, or pear, or peach. Just some grilled peach. Oh, man. That sounds really good. And I did have dinner. And then you just fold the edges over, and that's it. And then you bake it. The nice thing about galets is they typically bake a lot faster because they're fairly thin. They also don't have quite as much filling. It also depends on just how big you're going to make it. Like I have seen galets that are this big. I've seen some that are like personal. So you, whichever, however big you want to make it. Any questions on a galet? All right, my pie crust. 
This is where I, I, I hate to break it to you, but you've been lied to. Who uses cold butter to make their pie dough? It's all right. I'm here to save the day. So let me ask you a couple questions. When were pies invented? A, a very long time ago. It was actually the medieval period. Um, you know the saying, four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie? Yeah, so medieval period, they actually plucked the bird, wrapped the pastry around the bird, and baked it with the legs sticking out, and that's how you ate it. Not kidding. I mean, obviously, since then, things have come a long way for pies, and they don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, but that's when pies were invented. So when was refrigeration invented? Who's been to our dining by decades and, and remembers the 30s? 1935 is when commercial refrigeration was invented. No, I'm not talking ice boxes. I'm talking refrigeration, commercial refrigeration. 1935. So for what? The me medieval period was in the, what, 1400s? 19th, that's what, 500 years, 400 years? When did pies become really popular in the US? Anybody know? Westward Ho. So that's a really long extension cord as you're heading west on the Oregon Trail, right? Like, there's just no way. So for centuries, and I mean centuries, people were making pie dough without cold butter. And I'm gonna get on a little bit of a soapbox. It makes me so mad when people talk about having to use cold butter and cold water to make pie dough. That's nonsense. And I had to switch my word very quickly there. It does, because, and that's why most people don't make pie dough anymore, is because it's too difficult, because of the cold butter. The science behind it is really very simple, because baking is chemistry. Anyone who's taken any of my classes, whether it's here at the library or out at my bakery at the hands-on classes out there, I say this in every single class because it is absolutely the truth. Baking is chemistry. It's a formula. And if you don't get the formula right, it won't work. That's the difference between cooking and baking. You can kind of fudge stuff with cooking. You can fix stuff. You can't fix stuff if it's baking because it's chemistry. So the chemistry behind my pie dough recipe is using room temperature butter and or lard. Now I'm gonna talk about lard for a second. Lard is an amazing fat. It, it has the same properties as butter if you can find it from a reputable butcher. I would not, under any circumstances, recommend the red brick o lard that you find in the grocery stores. It's been bleached to within an inch of its life, and it's not really lard anymore. It's more of a shortening. Now, this recipe can work with shortening, but honestly, butter is way better for you because um, it's butter. Again, people have been eating butter for centuries. So. Room temperature butter and or lard, or a mix of the two. You could totally do that. You can do whatever you want, because it's pie. So equal parts butter and lard. We're gonna, and we're gonna do this when we pick a name, and then we're gonna show you how this works, because I've got room, I don't have a refrigerator here, I got room temperature butter up here. And we're going to go through and make, the, make this uh, pie dough. And you'll see how incredibly simple it is to make. And it only has five ingredients. And you only need this to make it. You don't need any special equipment. In fact, we're using plastic bowls and your fingers. Like, that's it. Flour, water, salt, butter, and or lard, and vinegar. Now, not a lot of vinegar because we don't want to taste it, but a little bit. So what's happening is we're going to encapsulate the flour in fat. Now wait a minute, what? 
So the cold butter method wants you to encapsulate the fat in flour. We're going to do the exact opposite. When you've made your pie crust before, have they been tough and just kind of like a piece of steel wool? Right? Just really leathery, not very flaky, just really tough. It's because you've overworked the gluten. And gluten is the, the key to 95% of baking. What we're going to do is by encapsulating the flour in fat, we're going to reduce the amount that you can work the gluten. By reducing the amount that we're working the gluten, it can't get tough. And I saw some eyebrows raised with the vinegar. We're going to add some vinegar. Who remembers third grade science? I mostly don't. I'll be honest, but I do remember that oil and water don't mix. What is fat? Oil, all right? It's a solid oil, solid at room temperature oil. If oil and water don't mix, and we're adding water to this, hmm, we're using three really simple steps to get the flaky layers. We're encapsulating the flour and fat. We're adding water with vinegar because water and fat don't mix. And what about acid and fat? Anybody remember that from third grade science? Acid actually repels fat. It actively repels it. So by encapsulating the, fat and the flour and fat, we're not letting the gluten fully form so it can't get tough. And then we're keeping the flour and water from getting together because of the fat because oil and water don't mix. And then by adding the acid, which is the vinegar, we're actively pushing the fat molecules away from each other to get flaky layers in a dough that will roll out so incredibly easy, you just won't believe it. Because that's the other thing that people hate when they get their pie dough or trying to make pie dough is they try and roll it out and it all falls apart because it's dry and crumbly. Well, that's terrible. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make some pie dough, and you're going to see how easy it is to make. Now, the thing to remember, though, is this, this process that we're about to do for the pie dough is the same process you would use to make scones and biscuits. So all right, so we're ready to collect names. And let's, um, Erin's got a bucket. So she's going to come around and grab everybody's names. Are there any questions in the meantime while we're doing this so I can get everybody going and ready to make some pie dough? Yeah? Do you have a trick when you make the two crust pie to make sure the bottom crust gets done? No. It depends on what I'm making. So if it's a, like An a, apple pie. okay, apple pie, I, I just make sure I bake it long enough. And this recipe won't be an issue. Uh, also making sure it's rolled not too thick. So a nice, like, 1 16th to 1 8th of an inch will make sure that as well. And the other thing is um, using a thin pie tin. Again, the glass or ceramic okay. can sometimes, they, they're insulators. So if you've got a, a thick uh, pie vessel that it's in, sometimes it will be too thick and not let you uh, cook it all the way. That's a great question. So the question's on what type of flour to use, all purpose. Um, pastry flour has less gluten, so they're trying to cheat the system by using something that doesn't have as much gluten in it to get the flakiness. But you don't need it. Just regular all-purpose flour. We use King Arthur all-purpose flour. That's what we use. Isn't that higher gluten, though? Mm -mm. Um, we use the King or the Sir Galahad. It's standard. I mean, there's a range in all purpose anyway. So all purpose generally is between 11 to 13 percent. As long as it's in there, it's considered all purpose. Yeah, anything more than that, and it's going to be bread flour, and you don't want that. It won't. It'll be too tough because you have more gluten to work with. But did that answer your question? Sugar or milk or egg white. 
I, we do um, an egg wash with heavy cream and whole egg, and then sprinkle sugar. So egg wash is egg with a little water and cream. Eggs and whole cream. Eggs and cream. It's actually what we use to make our quiche with. <laughs> and it's, um, we make a gallon of it at a time, and it's, um, yeah, because again, we make so many quiche. Um, that way we're not having to make something else. We just use the, the quiche custard for it and then sprinkle um, sanding sugar. So it's, we use a mix of turbinado and um, a larger crystal sugar on top so it sparkles and has a nice color and crisps up nice and beautiful. But that's only on fruit pies. If I'm making a lemon meringue, then I'll use a Swiss meringue for that. But if it's a double crust pie, I use um, an egg wash and then the sugar. And the more sugar, the better. Plugra. Plugra, P-L-U-G-R-A. Okay. It's a European style butter. Um, Kerry Gold is also a really good butter. And that's a really good point. Thank you so much for asking that. Unsalted. One of the things you should know about pastry chefs is we are control freaks. Straight up. The more we can control in the process, the more success we're going to have. And, and it might sound really strange, but the, the more I can control, even the butter, the salt on the butter makes a big, big, big difference. Because I didn't add it, so I don't know how much is in there. So unsalted butter, a European style. Plugra is fairly expensive. I want to say I saw it at the grocery store in Chelsea. It was um, an eight ounce piece was like five bucks, which is about the same as a whole pound. Um, Kerrygold, Costco typically has those on sale with a Kerrygold Irish butter. It's a European butter. Um, butter in America is not as, doesn't have as much fat. And at the end of the day, fat's where it's at. I mean, I'm just, that's where the flavor is. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite material for a pie plate? Pie Cheap plate. tins. Cheap. The dollar store but tins. You're not talking about the, those foil things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely talking about those foil things. I love those things. They're economical. I can reuse them unless I get too robust and cut through the tin when I'm cutting my pumpkin pie, which I did at Thanksgiving. But um, yeah, I, they're great. They're universal. They can fit anything. They can be frozen. They can be baked. And for most, I mean, I'm a small business owner, so they're economical. Yeah. I, yeah. So acid and fat repel. Right. So by encapsulating the flour and fat and adding an acid to it, we're yes. actively, the vinegar, yep, the acid is the vinegar, we're actively pushing the fat molecules away from each other, which since the flour is encapsulating, is encapsulated by the fat, we're keeping the flour from getting together as well. So it creates the flaky layers and won't let the gluten strands fully form. Does that make sense? Well, the, so the encapsulating the flour and fat is we're shortening the gluten strands by that act, which means the water can't fully absorb into the flour, which is the second point. And then the third one is the acid repels the fat. And what is the salt? <laughs> flavor. Oh, it's purely flavor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. Uh, you do need some. Salt also does um, restrict gluten development. So you need a little bit, but like in this, I think it's like, I don't know, a pinch. So it's not, not very much at all. Now, if you know you're making something savory, you could use apple cider vinegar. I wouldn't recommend balsamic. <laughs> I mean, but if you want, go for it, right? Like if you know, but I'm just kidding, no. I would say um, either table white, you know, distilled vinegar, um, or apple cider would be the only two I would go with. And I've, I've rarely used anything other than those two. Any other questions before we start pulling names? Yeah. Oh, good point. Thank you for that. Um, the only caveat to this is it cannot, so usually, when you make your pie dough, you roll it out, then you bring the scraps back together and roll it out to do something. Don't do that with this. 
you'll overwork the gluten and you'll have some tough scraps. What you can do, though, is sprinkle it with some cinnamon sugar and bake it. Or just not roll it too, too big. But yeah, because the way, because the three things that we're using to keep the flaky layers, if we bring it back together, we're going to overwork it. And I mentioned the scones and the biscuits, that's the same process. If you ever make buttermilk biscuits and then bring it all back together and notice that that second set doesn't rise quite as high, it's the same reason. You're overworking the gluten. And anyone who's ever had or made hockey puck biscuits, that's why. Because gluten strands should be relaxed and groovy. Gluten strands should be kind of flowy, right? Gluten strands, depending on what you're making, are either going to be really tightly bound for, say, baguette, right? Because that's what makes it a baguette. Or kind of, whew, all right, kind of chill for, say, brioche, right? So again, controlling the gluten and how much or not we develop it will depend on what we're making and what we, we're trying to do. So if you're trying to go for a baguette, work it. If you're making brioche, not so much. Did that answer your question? Yeah. All right, I'm sure I got everything else on there. Oh, yeah, 30 minutes. Once you've made your pie dough, it should be refrigerated for 30 minutes. If you go too soon, you'll overwork the gluten. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to be really controlled on this, control freak, um, so that we don't do that, so that it stays nice and flaky. Um, da, da, da. I'm sorry? Great question, absolutely. You can freeze it either raw, partially baked, or fully baked. And depending on what you have in it, you could bake, you could freeze the whole thing. So apple pie, freeze it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I typically won't let an apple pie out of my sight for about a you know, day or two, but um, <laughs> Um, you, could, you could freeze the dough up to six months. Um, if it's by itself, I would recommend rolling it and putting it in its tin before you freeze it. That way, when you're ready to, you're just ready to rock and roll, put whatever you're going to put in it, and then bake it. Or, you know, if it's a fully baked shell, put your chocolate mousse in and then just, you know, grab a fork. But yeah, up to six months. Yeah. Yep, um, you can refrigerate at least 30 minutes, but no more than, in the refrigerator, no more than two days. Anything beyond two days, it'll start to go rancid. Because it shouldn't be that, you, sh you shouldn't cook, I mean, wait to do any pie that long anyway. But um, the pie dough needs to be cooked within a 48 hour period, unless frozen. Yep, you've made it, it's in a ball. You could pat it into a disc and then refrigerate it for 30 minutes. And I would recommend patting it into a disc because you're gonna roll it out eventually, right? And who remembers Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Remember those, the, one of the, the only one I remember is begin with the end in mind. I want a round piece of pie crust. I'm gonna put it in a flat disc so when I roll it, it's round. So I just do a disc so it doesn't take as long to roll because I want to get to my pie. Yeah? You could wrap it in plastic wrap. We've got um, Ziploc bags for people to take their pie dough home tonight. So yeah, anything airtight for the 30 minutes. If you're freezing, absolutely airtight because you don't want anything to get into it. The other thing with the refrigerator is there's moisture in the refrigerator where there's not in the freezer. And if you see little brown spots, on your pie dough, you've, let it, you've waited too long. Don't eat it. But that's typically after like six days. But again, I, I, I can't wait that long. Because it's pie. How on earth could you wait that long to make pie? I just don't have that kind of willpower. I don't. Any other questions before we get started? Yeah. With all the pie you eat, how do you stay so slim? And well, talk to my doctor. He doesn't think I am. Um, but honestly, I don't know. Probably because I'm, I'm on my feet and working, you know, again, I'm a small business owner, so I'm 18 hours a day. Pie is health food, right? 
It is. It totally is. Um, it can be. I mean, there's nothing wrong with quiche. And it, I don't sit and have a pumpkin pie every day. Although at Thanksgiving, I got to admit, I, I ate a whole pumpkin pie. I'm not kidding by myself. And I got kind of mad when my girlfriend was like, let me have a piece of pie. I'm like, it's your own. <laughs> Thanksgiving, it's pumpkin pie. And she did. She got her own. Yeah. How, how big a pie will this uh, batch? Nine inch. Be like eight inch or nine inch? Nine inch. <laughs> yep. It'll typically do a nine inch pie. I mean, obviously, if it'll do a nine inch, it'll do an eight inch. Um, and we use a, a deep dish tin. So, um, and we, I try again to not have too much left over on the sides because why waste it? I mean, even though you can cinnamon sugar and bake it, it's like, it goes in the pie. Yeah? Are the proportions you give it, can you double those to make two pots at once? You can double it, you can quintuple it, you can octuple it, or you can go, like when we do it, so you're using four ounces of butter tonight. When we do it, we're using, we use six pounds of butter and six <laughs> pounds of lard. At the same, so 12 pounds of fat. So yeah, you can absolutely go higher. Yep. Yeah. What's your favorite method of crimping the pie crust? I like to, to come, I, it's weird because I'm left-handed, but I come around and I use my, and I make a rope. Okay. Yep, I do, yeah, I, I take my, my forefinger and I kind of bring it together and then push against the side of the tin as I'm going around, and I just use that, and it makes like a rope texture around it. I don't, like, I ain't got time for this. Because I just want to eat my pie. Yeah. Any other questions? I think this is the last one. Oh, where'd my thing go? Oh, here it is. I do, um, I do because I have, this is one of the few recipes I have memorized. So you're doing half, I'm sorry, you're doing a quarter of this tonight. So my pie dough recipe is five cups of flour, one pound of butter or lard, or eight ounces butter, eight ounces lard, so one pound of fat, a teaspoon or Two, depending on if you're going sweet or savory, of salt. A cup of water. And a dash of vinegar. I'd say half a teaspoon. Yeah. You can, but you don't need to. I'd say, I mean, a, a teaspoon at most, but at least a half a teaspoon. No. No, you cannot use coconut oil. It has to be, because um, coconut oil is, is too soft. It melts, the melt point is too low. Um, it needs to be a higher melt point. Um, coconut oil can be liquid at room temperature. Um, but it, whereas um, butter and lard are solid at room temperature, but still soft. And that's the trick, is it, it cannot be liquid. And I'm, I, Appreciate you bring that up. If you need to soften your butter, and let's say you use a microwave to do that, perfectly acceptable. Um, it can't be liquid in any way. If it is, mix it together and make it really soft. Um, but it cannot be liquid because if it's liquid, the butter will absorb the liquid. I'm sorry, the flour will absorb the liquid, and you're defeating the whole point. Because the point is to encapsulate the flour in fat. And you can only do that with a soft fat. Don't even need to dice it. You can stick your finger in it. But you don't even need to dice it. Just a whole, whole, I mean, you'll get, typically, you don't buy the whole pound blocks like I get. You get the four sticks. But as long as you can stick your finger in it, it's good to go. What I just gave you, the five cups, will do um, either, I mean, because again, we make it such large amounts, I got to scale it back in my head. Um, it will make two double crusts, 
and one single crust. Or five single crusts. Like two double crust pies and then one single crust pie. Or five single crusts. And that's assuming you're using, so a standard size for a full pie is eight ounces for a top and bottom. For a pot pie, standard size is four ounces. So a standard crust size is eight ounces. Uh, standard pot pie size is four ounces. You ever try the vodka crust recipe? Uh, if I'm working with vodka, I'm just going to drink it. Oh. Um, but it does the same thing because it's an acid. So it, it, has, it, it does the same thing that the vinegar does. But I'm just going to add some Coke or like whatever and have a, never mind. How do you keep the, the bottom crust from getting soggy? That was, oh, soggy? I've never, ever, ever had that happen. Even with pumpkin pie. Is it the thinness of the pie skin that you need? It probably is. It's also, I was telling this lady up here, how thin the crust is. Okay. Like it should be a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch thick. It shouldn't be very thick. Okay. But again, with the pie tin being so thin, it does, you know, cook more evenly. But yeah, when we did, because for Thanksgiving, we did, you know, we took orders um, and we did 125 pie and not one of them had a soggy crust. We did the cooked apple fruit filling, and uh, like we did parbake the pumpkin shells, but we did not parbake the apple shells. You don't, do, you, do you fully bake the pumpkin, or just parbake? We just parbaked it, oh. just because we had so many to go through, and to keep the oven space going, we, you know, we we didn't want to spend an hour in the oven. It spent 35 minutes, so we took some time a day or two ahead of time par baked the shells, added the custard, and then baked it for less time. How do you, what's your baking temperature? And do you shift it around in the oven? That's a really interesting question. Who's been to my bakery and seen my oven? My oven is 10 foot square. It's ginormous. I cannot regulate the temperature on that monster. No, um, my, de my oven also has four decks. So we use the bottom two decks for bread because the bread loves heat. So we use the decks three and four where it's a more moderate temperature. Um, we set the, the dial at 425, but you know, Paul, I've named my oven Paul. He likes to go to 450 sometimes. Sometimes he'll drop down to 420, but he is the hottest down here and the coolest up here, which like physics being like, wait a minute, heat rises, but the decks are so well insulated that they stay hot. So we use a moderate temperature. So it's about 425 ish. And, and I can't really gauge that. I have oven thermometers in there, but they still, it's still too wonky. I still can't regulate the temperature very well. So I adjust the time. And, and I, so like I said, I start with 35 minutes and then kind of use a probe thermometer to verify that I'm cooking things all the way. Same with our quiche. Just as long as it hits 190, it's done. You cook everything all, like the breads and pies and quiches all at once at the same time? Because we've, we've got production to do. So yeah, like my bread guy will have our multi-grain and our roasted garlic cheddar in the bottom two decks while I'm making cookies and macarons. completely separate. There's a stone hearth between each one. So each deck is a stone hearth. And that's why it's so well insulated. So there's no, like I said, I can't regulate the temperature between the decks at all. So that's why I adjust the time on it. I saw another, thought I saw another hand. All right, so they're going to kick us out soon. Salt. Salt. Yep, just a uh, quarter teaspoon ish, like not even. Okay. Um, in this recipe, in that recipe, a teaspoon. I'm sorry. This one. Yep, in that one. Five cups of flour. One pound of butter. One cup of water. A teaspoon of salt, and a dash of vinegar. Half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. 
Got it? Everyone clear? Awesome. All right, we ready to pick some names? And while we're cut, while we're getting names, we're gonna wipe down tables so that because you're gonna need to to um, need the pie dough on the table. So we're gonna come through and clean the tables off while we're doing names. So listen, or should I come back with my microphone? Would that be be, be louder? Linda K. Okay. Wendy Fanson. Maggie Burns. Uh, Monique. Judy S. You keep doing this and yeah. I'll head up there. All right. Chuck H. That's good. <laughs> Kathleen W. Emily Blunt. All right. Everyone needs one of these. Janelle one Z. These. One of these. Nancy M. One of these. One of these. Um, Wolfgang and someone whose name I can't read. Blah, flower. Diana. Butter. Oh, hang on, you need your. Francesca. Francis. Gary and Kendra. Nikki Baker. Marilyn D. Victor. Bit, so be careful. Denise P. And Danny. Yep, grab a water. Hey. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Don't forget your water. Okay. Thank you very much. So, and your water. Got your water? Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and then we'll do that so you don't drop it. How's that? Thank you. You're very welcome. Hey there. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Got it? Got it. Yeah. And Thank butter. God. One, two, three. And flour. Last but not least. Awesome. Thank you. All right, I'm so excited. All right, so you are gonna get your hands dirty. Hope you're okay with that. You might wanna take off rings with any intricate filigrees. And it might be easier if you stood up. In fact, it will be easier if you stand up. All right, so. In the bowl is flour and salt. By the magic of TV, that's ready to go for you. And in the cup is water and vinegar. See what I did there? Right? Again, working smarter, not harder. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the butter. Not yet. When we're ready, we'll do it together. I'll tell everyone. But what you're going to do is you're going to take the butter, open it, and put it the whole thing in the bowl with the flour. And you take your hands and you're gonna like cover the butter with the flour and then you're gonna start the frissage. Okay, the first, I'm gonna turn my back to you. I don't mean to be rude, but it's easier for, for you to see this. What you're gonna do is you're gonna come up from the bottom and with your pinkies and your thumbs, you're gonna do this. You're gonna keep coming up and you're gonna keep doing this. Like you're fanning money. This is called frissage. It's like a massage, but with a fra. 
for a sage. And you're going to keep doing that process until all the big bits of butter are gone. When the big bits of butter are gone, you're going to start the rubbing process. Again, I'm going to turn my back to you. I don't mean to be rude. But you're going to grab some of it, and you're going to start to rub. And notice my hands are cupped. And as I'm rubbing, I'm going to flatten them out. And I'm going to keep doing that until the whole thing looks like cornmeal. Now, those cold butter people, that's the only part they got right. <laughs> I mean, they're about to get something right. But it has to look like cornmeal. When it looks like cornmeal, you're going to dump, dump all of the water in at once. I ain't got time for that sprinkle, sprinkle, sprinkle nonsense. I ain't the one. Once you've dumped all the water in, you're going to take one hand, I'm getting, I'm left-handed, one hand on the bowl, one hand in the flour, in the mixture, and you're going to go around and push. And you're going to turn the bowl, and you're going to keep doing that. You're going to go around and push against the side of the bowl. And it will stick to your hand. It's supposed to. When it sticks to your hand and there's like no bits down in the bowl, you're going to put it out on the countertop, tabletop, and you're going to knead. In the kneading process, you're going to take, you're going to use the palm of your hand, the butt over here, and you're going to bring it over and push, and over and push, over and push, over and push. And you're going to keep doing that process until there's no bits on the table. It's done. And it's 7.05, and I bet we will be done by 7.25. Maybe 7.30, but I doubt it. All right, y'all ready? All right, open the butter, put your butter in the bowl. And then toss the butter in the flour, cover the butter with the flour, and then start the frisage method. Remember, from your pinkies to your fingers, just frisaging. This is one and a quarter cups. Yeah, this is a quarter of that batch that I told you. Yep. Yep, keep doing that. A quarter of a cup. Yep, keep doing that. Try not to have your hands over like this because your hands are hot. You want to come up from the bottom. Come up from the bottom and frisage. Get both hands in there. It's okay. <laughs> Promise it'll be all right. Yep. Come up from the bottom and frisage. And just keep doing that until there's no big pieces. Come up from underneath. There you go. And then frisage. Just keep doing this process. And when there's no big pieces of butter, start the rub. Water and vinegar. Yep. Water cup? A uh, quarter cup. Okay. Oh, it's, it's already mixed in. Yep. That's why. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we just, I didn't, didn't have time to. I had a question about the cooked fruit thing you were yeah. talking about mm -hmm. with, with apple pie. Mm -hmm. If you make the goo, like you said, and you put fresh apples in, so like apple slices. You could use it if you took apple cider yeah. and cooked that down with yeah. sugar and cornstarch, yeah. that would create the goo. Right. Right, but then do you mix fresh it with apples. fresh apples? You could, but you it's easier just to cook all of it at once, so the apples aren't as... Um, no, but I'm not understanding what makes it an apple pie then and not just a gooey pie. Because there's um, the, there's more apple than goo versus the, the no, strawberry. Well, so you're going to have apples yeah. well, in with the cider. But, um, no, the, I'm, I'm just not getting it. Right. So it's... Again, this is what we make. It's five pounds of five pounds of apples. Okay, they're chopped up, they're peeled, sliced, sliced peeled and okay. sliced. Okay. Um, a cup of cornstarch, yep. three cups of sugar, yep. a cup of water. All right. And then whatever spices we want to put in. All right. And we cook that until it's clear and bubbly. Okay. 
that that cooks the apples down oh, and I also see. creates okay. a little bit of goo. A little bit of goo, got it. Yeah. And then you put that in the pie shell and you bake it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm asking because I have peach trees in the you Same process. So same thing. Same thing. Yep, start rubbing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep, start. Keep frisaging. There you go. You're almost ready to start rubbing. You look, start rubbing. I was going to ask you. Yep, start rubbing. Keep, yep, you can start the rub process. How much are you pies? It depends on the pie, um, but typically between 20 and 30, depending on what it is. I asked a question about strudel because <laughs> we recently joined this gourmet cooking night, mm -hmm. and I make sourdough bread. Yes. Yeah. So I Hang tight. Yeah, you, I would stop there. They wanted me to use phyllo dough. I decided I used it. It's not stretchy. I used this Yeah. Yep, I would stop there. Yep, hang tight. You good. Stop there. Yep. It doesn't matter. Stop there. Stop there, stop there. Go, keep going. Stop there, stop there, stop. Yep, you're good, stop. Stop, stop. Stop. You've added your water? Keep going. All right, if you've not added your water, add it now, keep going. Dump your water in. Okay, when I was just massaging. It's small enough. Did okay, you so got, yep. And then that's when you do the water now? Yep, dump the water in right now. Don't need them. You, you really don't, you really, I mean, you could, but this is really a feel. Yeah, so dump your water and you're good to go. Nope, then, now, yes, now it's, now it's the push, coming around and pushing. Okay, I have two people that are confused. Yep. Now, if it, bring it out on the countertop and knead it. More. More pressing. more pressing, yep. Yeah, keep doing that. Bring it out on the counter and, and knead. They got one and a quarter cups. A quarter of a cup, yep. Br yep, bring it out, keep pushing a little bit more. Knead, 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 bring it out on knead. Yep, everything from the bowl on the counter and just with your hands, kind of a push. Yep, bring it out on the counter and start kneading. Yep. Hey, look, you're done. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, is that, the kneading's very different from the pottery. It, 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 it is. The pottery is like, say it's that. It's, it, that will work, but you, you don't want to be careful doing that because you don't want to overwork it. You want to just use the one hand so that you're evenly mixing without, like, that. that's perfect. Good job. Perfect. I can, that's awesome. Yeah. You're done. Keep going a little bit more, not much. Keep going. Keep going a little bit. Keep going. Don't use your fingertips. You use, your, use the palm of your hand. There, yeah. Yep. So bring up and push. Got it. See how I'm? Yeah. Go a little bit more. Yep, on the countertop. Okay. Start kneading. You're done. I need yeah. it in my bowl. You, absolutely. I would need a little bit longer just to get all those bits in. Okay. But yeah. See how I'm pushing with this part of my hand? Okay. That's it. Beautiful. Look at that. You, you could go a little bit more, but not much. Look at that beautiful pie dough. Oh, thank you. It's done. Really? It's done.
I don't have any pans. And I didn't bring a rolling pin. It's got to rest for 30 minutes anyway. Roll it out. Just roll it out. Um, just 10, 11 inches. Yeah. Yep. D beautiful. Done. Use the palm of your hand. Yep. Yep, so you, you like this. There, push, push. You see, you've got more, more pushing to do. And push all the way around and pick up all this here that's on the table. Roll it around. Just like that. Just keep doing that. Hey, look, you made pie dough. All right, space nerd, you're done. You're done. I miss classes so much. I'm going to tell everybody in a second, but no. <laughs> let me let me squeeze by behind you for a second. Here, let me help you out for a minute. Just You're almost an FYI, there. that Keegan has you amazing so sauces for sale in case anyone wants to buy any, because he's not going to tell you so himself. You Up at the front. Down. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Well, we just spent two days making Look at that. Pie dough. And that's the bag for your pie dough. Sorry, I'm going to live behind you again. All right, here's your chair back. Thank you. All right, so, all right, so I'm, what do you think? Everyone's made pie dough. Yay. And I was so far off, it took 10 minutes. In a room full of a bunch of people that have never done this before. So imagine how fast it would be at home. It took 10 minutes. All right, so a couple points I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about real quick. Notice you did not put any flour down on the countertop before you started kneading, did you? Why? Because that flour is not encapsulated in fat. If you add more flour at this point, you, that's not encapsulated in fat, it's gonna be tough. So when you're rolling this out, like you see how smooth this is? When you're rolling this out, you'll need a little bit of flour. Not a lot, just a little bit. Because again, you don't want to introduce any more flour that's not been encapsulated in fat or it'll toughen it up. So just a little bit on the countertop and a little bit on the rolling pin. Now, rolling pins, I don't care what kind of rolling pin you use. It could be the French style tapered. It could be the old fashioned where you're gonna run like what it, with the handles, whatever you're comfortable with. Whatever's going to be easy for you to roll. And just roll it out to about 10, 11 inches, depending on the size of the pie tin you're using. And it will pick up super easy. It, again, it's not a crumbly piece of pie dough that's going to fall apart the second you try and pick it up to put in your pie tin. It will pick up, put it in your pie tin. <laughs> it's like that easy. Make sure you get it all the way in the corners of the pie tin so that you don't miss out any filling, right? Because we want all the filling we can get. And it is almost, almost impossible to overwork this unless you bring it back together and roll it again, right? But on this first go, rolling it, kneading it together, it's almost impossible to overwork it. And again, y'all did, I didn't touch any of them. This was all you guys. And if you look at it, your pie dough, you'll see that it's kind of marbled. That's the fat. And if you look at it and kind of hold it in your hands and kind of spread a little bit, you'll see them kind of crags. That's the flaky layers. And it took 10 minutes. We started at 7.05 and we were done at 7.15. Any questions? Yeah, why did you say to use our palms and not our fingers? 
because you want to get some stretch on the gluten strands. So you want a nice even pressure and your fingertips aren't enough to do that. So that's why you push, fold over and push. And you keep that motion so that it comes together just a little bit quicker. Any other questions? So the, the, it's the same process with biscuits, but the acid is buttermilk, right? So it's, that's what buttermilk biscuits are great, because I love buttermilk biscuits. It's the same process. You'd also let it rest a little bit in between, covered for about 10 minutes with a tea towel, a moist tea towel, and then roll flat, and then use your cutter to cut your biscuits. I prefer square biscuits, because that way I don't have to bring it back together. I can use every inch as biscuit. I mean, who cares? It's a biscuit, right? Who says they have to be round? That's why scones, if you see round scones, they're not really scones. It's a biscuit with stuff in it. Scones should be triangular shaped or not very evenly shaped because you, you shouldn't, if you use a round cutter, you're, you're, you're not getting the full scone. It should be really rustic and triangular-ish in shape. But it's the same process. So, how confident do we all feel about making pie dough now? Right? Like I told you, it was easy, didn't I? And now you're my minions. Your job is to spread the word on how easy it is to make pie dough. Because it's, that's what the saying, it's easy as pie, right? It ain't saying came from somewhere. So it, it really is easy as pie. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So is that a similar, like, cru like a crust? It's more of a short dough crust. Mm -hmm. Is that called a short Yeah, short it's more of a short crust. Um, more like a, I would say a Scottish shortbread, but very similar to a Scottish shortbread with the additional uh, fat. And the sour, the cream cheese has some acid in it already. Mm -mm. Yeah, it has a little bit of acid in it already. That's what makes it cream cheese. Yeah, but you could use the Nuff Chessel, Nuff the other stuff, the, the neuf, neuf, who knows how to pronounce it? Neuf Chatel. You could use that as well. Um, it has a milder flavor than cream cheese, and it's a little bit softer. I find it, um, especially if I'm making a piped cookie, it works a lot better because it is a bit softer. But yeah, it's the same basic process. Yeah. How much water did you put in the whole pot? Quarter of a cup. Quarter. Yep, what you had tonight was a quarter of what is the what I told you. So there was one and a half cups flour, a quarter cup water, four ounces of butter. So it was, I just took the main recipe and quartered it down. So this is just a tad more than one cup. Yeah. So we got a lot of cinnamon sugar going. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions on pies or pie dough or fillings or what we did or what y'all did? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one of, and I'm not trying to be glib. I'm not trying to, to not answer your question. When, when I hire a new baker, they always ask me all the time, well, how long do I bake this for? And my answer is always the same until it's done. And it's done when it's done. And they say, well, how long? I don't know. There's just, there's too many variables. Probe thermometer, 190, it's done. That's crap. Sorry, I probably shouldn't say that. But yeah, it's nonsense. You don't need to do that. Because it, it's, it's a custard. So just, yeah, just bake it until it's done. How long do you bake the pie? It depends on the pie. I mean, like, which pie, pumpkin pie, you just use your thermometer? Yeah, because again, my oven is completely different than your oven. So I'm going to have no way to tell. I mean, there's, there's so many variables that go into an oven. Is it gas, electric, conventional, convection? Is it in a countertop? Is it standalone? How old is it? How clean is it? How well insulated is it? So you go by temperature. Temperature. Of fruit pies Always temperature. temperature. If, 190. If it hits 190, it doesn't matter what it is, it's done. Gluten coagulates at 189.6 degrees. So if you hit 190, <laughs> same thing. Infrared only does surface temperature. 
You want a probe thermometer to go all the way in to verify it? Yeah. Whether it's bread, um, cookies, banana bread, muffins, a pot roast, like probe thermometer is the way to go. Can you give us a little of your bio where you learned your craft and all that? Yeah, so um, I've, I've been doing baking and pastry since I was about nine. Um, I started professionally when I was 17 at Zenders up in Frankenmuth. Um, and I've, I've been, I've worked at the Peabody in Memphis. I was at a patisserie in Memphis called La Baguette. Um, I was also at a place called Squash Blossom where they hired me to transform traditional French pastries into um, gluten-free vegan, which early 90s was very difficult because the ingredients weren't available to do that. Um, and then I, I've worked in a variety of other restaurants, the Holiday Inn in Memphis, um, made my way back to Michigan, and just loved baking and pastries. I started as, I uh, went back to culinary school at Schoolcraft, um, graduated with honors from the culinary program in baking and pastries. Um, I worked for Courtney Clark at Cake Nouveau. Who remembers Cake Nouveau from Ann Arbor? Started as her baker and then took the position as the head baker at the People's Food Co-op. Um, and it was there that I was promoted to the prepared foods manager. And while I was there, realized that we needed a bigger kitchen. Um, Y'all have, have been to the co-op, right? Um, it's awesome place. You really should continue to, to go to the co-op. But the kitchen is super, super small. Um, and as a prep foods manager, um, I, the general manager and I had a conversation. And I was like, we can't grow because the kitchen space is just too small. I mean, it's physically just too small. Um, and so she and I were looking for another commercial kitchen to do like a commissary out of. Um, and we found a place out in Chelsea. And on the drive out there, we were both like, yeah, this is never going to work. But it was a really nice spring day, and we decided to go check it out anyway. Um, and it didn't work. There was just logistically no way that we could get people and food. It was just not going to work. Um, and it stuck in my head. Um, and I was like, huh, I wonder. Um, and it was still available. I checked the listing. Um, and then my mom passed away. And I would talked to her before she passed, and I was like, what do you think? And she's like, well, you've wanted this since you were like six. Do it. Um, and I put a bid in on the building. And then a lot of bizarre things happened. And um, they, you know, I, I'm not, I've never been rich. Um, and I <laughs> went to the U of M Credit Union and said, how do I buy this? And they said, you need $20,000 down. I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> crap salad um, and then my grand passed away um, and right after her passing I was offered a one-time buyout of my pension through FedEx when I worked for them which was enough to purchase the building so I literally cashed in my retirement to purchase the building um, I was still working at the co-op full-time as the prep foods manager I was working part-time here at the library doing what two classes a month ish and then um, part-time at Sur La Tab as an instructor there, and part-time as an instructor at Washtenaw Community College. Um, as you can tell, I don't sleep much. Um, and, and finally, at the, uh, I bought it in 2017. At the end of um, 2018, I um, turned in my resignation to the co-op and opened January of 19. And this is the end of our fifth year of business, and I am so humbly thankful for the community support, um, for the, the classes we do out there and people coming and buying a muffin and a loaf of bread and just coming by to say hi. Because um, this, this literally is my lifelong dream. And I'm so, so thankful that y'all come and spend some time with me tonight because I love pie. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Erin, thank you, Erin. She did mention we've got some, some sauces that we actually went through several hoops to jump through for the state to be able to jar and, and make them in the bakery. So uh, salted caramel and a chocolate Merlot sauce, if anyone's interested. They go really great on pie. So thank you.
Yep, the 80s, Dining by Decades at Pittsfield. I hope to see everyone there. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.